I'm now going back to case studies for risk assessment. Since we are already relatively late, and I, I uh, was already afraid that this will happen, I will run you relatively quickly through the idea of the case studies and the, the seven case studies, but the details um, are then on the internet, on the web page, and, and therefore you can go there um, to look at them in more detail. Um, okay, what is a day case study? Um, it's still um, the question, uh, everyone, if, if you read uh, um, new projects, everyone is talking about case studies, but it's also important to understand what that really means. And it is important that this is the particular situation. You had something very concrete, one example, and in our case, it's probably the, the example is using a specific software, but in this way also representing the whole area of this, uh, of this task in, in, drug uh, in, in, in toxicology. Now, if you talk about biokinetics, it will be a very specific software doing which we will use in the biokinetics um, uh, case study, but it also shows the same or the, the overall concept of how to do that. And, and this is, it's perhaps different to, to other case studies where you are then looking at a specific compound or a class of compounds or something like that. We are structuring, we will use compounds in this case studies, yeah, but the, the main focus is here definitely on the showing that this workflows, this software is able to solve this problem. Yeah, and um, the, the most important thing, it's, it's not a complete answer. Uh, it is, it's not a statistical survey. It's, it's just uh, showing the concept of one specific area. Um, I think Andy is here. He definitely, if you have questions through this, this paper, especially, then Andy is probably the better, um, better person to ask about that. Um, I mainly want to, um, to show that we have here, um, that we looked at to, to people already when creating these case studies. We looked at, at uh, the literature um, describing risk assessment frameworks and based on these um, information, we designed these seven case studies. Uh, and this is when you, when you look at this, um, this picture from this um, publication and then in principle, we picked here some, some areas which we then put into these uh, case studies. Um, and here, as I said, here is this information, a lot of information on a single slide. I will not go through that. This is more for reference for you. Um, the first thing is we have to get data, we have to create data, we have to, to search for data. And therefore we put that into one of the case studies. Uh, this data cure, uh, and also tries to build pre-reasoned data sets based on ontologies, therefore already by combining different data sets and data sources um, get to, to some kind of pre-reasoned or helps you getting, getting um, evidence from, from not just one single data set, but from, from multiple data sources. Uh, the second one, metabolism prediction um, is, is led by Dan Gerke, who is also available here today. Um, and then there we, we combine different approaches and, and also new approaches like docking and, and these kinds of things, building that into, the, into this case study. Um, and, but, but this is also an area where we would be interested to, to, to work together with, um, with associated partners. Um, then from, from Maastricht, uh, we have two uh, case studies on, on the combination of toxicogenomics and then going into the area of, of um, AOPs, key events, and bringing that together on the one side from Daniel uh, from Maastricht, um, building on top of an existing study which was using forward toxa, uh, DIXA data, but then combining that also with other sources. Um, and, and integrating tools for uh, toxicogenomics. Um, okay, then um, the second, perhaps I go first to this one because I already started here. Uh, the, the next thing is really this linking 
with ontologies, bringing that pathway analysis, uh, different pathway analysis tool like Wikipathway Wiki here again, Dixa has mentioned, to, to really come from, from data, bring data to, to the automatic um, prediction of, of key events. Uh, it's probably, or for sure, we need at the moment human curation of these, but at least we can get from data to, to some kind of ideas what the key event might look like. And then you go in there and, and, and look on additional public uh, um, publications to, to really make these key events or key event relationships um, or validate these. Going back to the um, PBVK kinetics, biokinetics case study uh, led by Frederick, probably most of you know him uh, because he's really one of the experts in there. Uh, we have, and I think this will be all already demoed in the second jackpot, which is providing access to the PK, PK SIM2. Um, finally, okay, the second one, another um, uh, grouping compounds on biological data, also driven by uh, Daniel, um, to, to have them, this grouping approach is read across based on biological readouts. And finally, uh, the, which will then, or this, this biological evidence will then go into this uh, read across uh, case study, uh, which is then building really combined uh, chemical biological read across tools um, based on probably mainly concentrating at that point on their hazard, but because of the biokinetics coming in from the biokinetics uh, case study, um, this can then also be combined with um, the kinetic uh, differences or similarities of these um, compounds to, to predict the unknown. Um, that was it, as I said, very quick because we are running out of time and I would really like to, to focus more on the, on the, um, on the demos. Uh, but if you have questions to the case studies and especially also if you are interested in providing input to these case studies. We would be really happy to work with you together on that. If you have another additional ideas of additional case studies, also that is something we would like to hear and, and then we can structure that around your ideas. Good. Okay, then next one would be um, Philip. Okay, uh, this is Philip Loganis from the National Technical University of Athens. I will be talking to you about the Jackpot modeling platform. And uh, it is involved in two uh, case studies. One is uh, modeling for prediction or read across, and one is reverse asymmetry in PBVK prediction. Uh, this is work uh, performed by Vadelis Karadzas, Philip Loganis, Aguilar Valsamis, George Tsiliki, and Harry Serembis. So, uh, Jackpot is a web modeling platform that has integrated uh, many functions uh, like uh, descriptor calculation services, uh, data mining and machine learning, domain of applicability calculations, experimental design, interlaboratory testing, uh, biokinetics modeling, as we will see uh, in the example, PKSIM, and HTTK is a work in progress, and dose response uh, modeling. Um, the two screenshots that we see uh, on the screen right now uh, one above is uh, the graphical user interface of Jackpot, and uh, the one below uh, is the application programming interface, uh, which we will talk about uh, in a while. So, uh, the modeling for prediction or read across case study uh, has the following workflow. Uh, first, you start with the training data set and the training algorithm. Uh, joining them and providing uh, specific parameters, you uh, uh, are leaded to a, a model. You produce a model uh, which you then, uh, if you uh, use the model, apply the model to a prediction data set, uh, or reversely actually, apply the prediction data set to the model, you can get uh, predictions, uh, the predicted data set. That is a general workflow and it is applicable to uh, various uh, uh, situations uh, uh, and research questions. So, um, 
at this point, I would like to uh, move on to the user interface. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, currently, it is hosted on our uh, on our servers, uh, but there will be a user interface uh, on the Open Research uh, Open Risk Net infrastructure. And um, the first um, function that we will do uh, is uh, that we will demo is uh, training a model. Uh, we will use one of the models that are uh, called example data set, one of the data sets that are as examples here. And uh, one uh, known example is one about uh, uh, from Gagevich and Tuzin et al. and uh, his team. And uh, it is about uh, 18 metal oxides with 29 descriptors for predicting toxicity. It is split into 10 metal oxides for prediction and eight for validation. Uh, we use the 10 uh, metal oxides and we will use the multiple linear regression uh, in uh, Weka. So in the next uh, uh, screen, we are requested to provide uh, something as a title and something as a description. Uh, usually, uh, you should uh, write something more uh, uh, descriptive than what I've written right now. And uh, what is um, important is that we can uh, do uh, many, um, from the user interface, we can do many variations for uh, uh, in the modeling that we, we perform. Uh, one is uh, we can select all the input variables and select uh, uh, to be used for modeling and select one endpoint, which uh, there's only one here regarding toxicity, that is log LC50. And um, another one, uh, it is uh, is not selecting all the uh, variables and just selecting a subset of them. Other options as we uh, are available, but um, for uh, brevity of time, we will not get into them. And uh, we select no scaling, but we uh, select uh, to have uh, domain of applicability calculations. Uh, we will uh, have to wait a little in order to uh, for the model to be trained. And that is the result of the training. This is the model uh, page. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, we see a model on our uh, uh, as a web page. It can be viewed on the browser and here what we see is its URI. And uh, later on uh, we will see that it uh, it is a, uh, an important uh, asset because it makes it available as uh, uh, to other services. Uh, so uh, for now we will validate the model. I clicked on validate and I will use the eight remaining metal oxides from the uh, data set. And what I have now is the external validation report. I get uh, information about the various uh, parameters that have been calculated, R squared values are gone according to OECD calculations. Uh, I get a table of real versus predicted data here, and uh, the QQ plot uh, and the real versus predicted values uh, plot. Uh, I can also hit this button and get a PDF uh, output of it, a PDF report, which I can share. Uh, with uh, collaborators and um, if we want to make a prediction we click predict and get uh, the link to the prediction uh, data set. Uh, we get a prediction uh, here and in this column, we also get the leverage values there from uh, the, the domain applicability uh, calculated from the leverage method. And also the QPRF report here, which is uh, editable and is something that we can uh, also use to, to report uh, our work. Um, okay, uh, so I will go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, what we saw now is, uh, using the user interface. That is something that allows us, uh, following that instruction, to use an analogy is how we can make one coffee, one cappuccino. 
uh, there's a lot of steps uh, sometimes in order to learn or in order to be specifically to pay specific attention you need to do them uh, each one of them uh, on your own uh, but what if you wanted to make this a thousand times and do it really fast that is where you need an API an application programming interface that would allow you to go to a service and or uh, give your order and get uh, the, the result that you want it really, uh, really fast, really accurately. Um, and the API is uh, something that is uh, that uh, the graphical user interface that we saw before is something that it builds upon. Uh, you, we might not have seen it right now, uh, but uh, uh, the, um, this is built upon uh, Swagger. Uh, this uh, Swagger interface is something that um, uh, this allows us uh, to uh, uh, have a, a view into uh, the uh, the API and uh, see its inner workings. Uh, so uh, uh, we see how calls can be made. How can you see what data sets are are available? Uh, you can see what tasks are inside uh, uh, are available uh, and can be communicated through the API so uh, we will not get into that uh, the modeling functionality that we saw is of course available uh, but uh, we will move on to see uh, the next case study which is about uh, reverse the symmetry and PBPK prediction uh, this is based on the PKSIM package, uh, which was uh, developed as part of the Open Systems Pharmacology Suite uh, by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, this has been made available uh, lately uh, as open source. And uh, the, the big advantage of uh, PKSIM is uh, that it is functional, that is that its functionality is wide and allows you to move on from compound to laboratory animal to human to, to one human or a population of humans. So um, uh, the workflow that uh, uh, we need, one needs to follow in order to do uh, PBBK predictions uh, using Jackpot is uh, first of all to start with a PBBK model uh, in XML format that has been uh, already uh, created in the desktop version of PKSIM. Uh, of, that was chosen because it uh, requires too many um, choices to be made, too much functionality that wouldn't make sense to integrate uh, on a, a web platform. Uh, that uh, on a web platform, uh, one needs to uh, do uh, calculations uh, more uh, uh, in a more focused fashion in order to answer more specific questions, which we'll see uh, in a while. Uh, we need to feed uh, uh, Jackpot with the data set with the physiological parameter values used for PBK model development, which is uh, the kind of specific values that were uh, used for that uh, person. Uh, so we see it was developed for a person aged 25 of uh, 1.81 uh, uh, meters high and 52 uh, uh, kilos weight. We integrate the PKC model into Jackpot. We will see uh, those parameters that we need to add. And after it has been uh, integrated into Jackpot, it is available as a model URI through its model URI as a web service. As the one that we saw before on the uh, user interface, which can be uh, hit uh, by external services that can give it a specific requests, give it data and uh, ask for predictions. Um, in the same sense, uh, we can use uh, this model to obtain drug concentration time profiles. Uh, and uh, what we need to give is an input data set with physiological parameter values for the predictions that we want, which means, uh, in this case, different age, height, and weight combinations. Uh, we will, uh, the last thing that we will see today is uh, how we, will, uh, we can do that. Uh, through uh, the API and uh, right now uh, what we have done 
uh, is um, sorry. Uh, right now, what we have done is that we uh, uh, that we will see uh, how we can, uh, of course, uh, train a model. Uh, okay, uh, so. Uh, first, we need to have the data set with the height, weight, and age uh, combination that we asked for. Um, this is why uh, this everything is available through its URI, uh, and it is in the Open Risk and Infrastructure in Jackpot. It is a service. It is a data set, and this is its ID. Uh, so. Uh, Right now we see it as a CSV and you can also see it as a JSON, but we'll omit that. And uh, uh, different parts of the functionality of the API are available as different tabs. By clicking on a tab, it expands. Right now I've chosen to expand the biokinetics tab, which is the one we will be focusing on. And uh, we will be uh, using the biokinetics PK sim create model functionality. So what we need to provide here uh, is uh, an XML file uh, that has been uh, produced by the desktop version of PKSIM. Uh, the, the data set URI um, uh, that shows uh, where uh, that uh, the data set that we saw before, uh, this is the URI, URI of the data set that we saw before, uh, a title and description of our choosing, uh, the algorithm that we'll, we'll be using, and the parameters, which uh, I uh, will show you uh, in more, uh, in bigger fonts, uh, which is the age unit in years. We, we will be talking about one individual. Uh, the height unit will be in meters, the weight unit in kilos, and we'll be, we will be talking about theophylline. Um, if we click try it out, and what we, uh, end up with is a model. Uh, this model uh, will be can be used with its ID here. Uh, it has a URI, of course, and uh, we can also apply a new data set uh, and get a prediction. We are here now in this stage uh, for we, where we give another data set and use the model to obtain the drug concentration time profiles. And uh, uh, the prediction that we have, that we get, uh, is this one. We get a prediction data set, uh, which we, where we have the substance, uh, a row about the substance, the DH, the height and weight, and what follows are uh, the values in different time, uh, the values of drug uh, concentration in different time uh, points. Uh, that, of course, uh, we can also see in uh, JSON format, not only uh, as a CSV. It contains more information. Uh, it is uh, harder to read uh, by um, uh, a, a human, uh, but of course it is richer uh, to provide to uh, a machine uh, a web service that will have much more information in order to provide a, a uh, a better service. Um, I'm meant to be brief. I hope I've said enough to intrigue you, and, uh, but not too much. Uh, I'm ready for questions if you have any. Cool. Thank you, Philip. Good. Yes. So my, my plan my plan was to give yeah. you this background and so on, but since we are sort of running late, I think I'm going to do like this and just go to the live demo immediately, uh, and then try to do a little bit of uh, background. I need to move it between windows or screens. Yeah. So what we have been doing is that we have uh, deployed a few of our uh, QSOR models uh, to this open risk net. Uh, environment, and uh, I should have copied a smile screen here somewhere because since I'm not a chemist, I think it's better if I go with a copied smile screen uh, instead of trying to draw something. 
So what we see here is um, our log D predictor. Uh, it uh, it works with a with a, a QSAR model deployed as a microservice, just like this. And uh, we are do, using a conformal prediction on this one, which means that we can change the confidence here. And this will uh, give another interval in the prediction down here. You see it changed uh, confidence and it gives another prediction. So uh, the coloring of the molecule means that the blue part uh, goes towards a low uh, log D value and the red part goes towards a high one. Uh, I'm going to switch back to my uh, live demo because I have the link to the the swagger, which you're familiar with by this time. So this one has only two endpoints. It has the prediction, which gives a value, uh, and the, the image, which you saw. So this is all made by the same microservice approach as we've seen before. Um, I also want to quickly show you some other models that we have made. Um, this one is... Uh, uh, Metpred, so cytometabolism and reaction type prediction service. I'm going to once again paste my favorite smiles in here. And you see that it produces an image and a string here or a text here uh, explaining where what uh, reaction types and where it happens. So this is a model that's been deployed. Uh, this one is not really a QSOR model and it's not made uh, by, it's not a machine learning algorithm, it's more of a lookup thing in the background. Um, and uh, then if this one is working or not, I, we have had some problems with the server. It, there's more than my stuff running on this one, and some stuff are hugging resources. Uh, it was working previously. So what this one is, this is a, a profile of uh, QSAR models. So each one of these is a little QSAR model. Uh, the one with the crossover here, they are not responding for some reason, probably because some other thing that's running on the same server is hugging all the resources. Um, we have this profile going on here. So each one of these is a, it's a gene, and we have from Campbell extracted the, the targets and built the model for each one of them. And we see here um, that uh, the models sort of indicate that these genes are not binding, and uh, this one might be binding, although it's a kind of low value. Uh, we have this confidence slider again that we can shift up and down, and then it, they will update this one. So if I if I want to be if I'm not really, really sure, then it will say that uh, a lot of them are both predicted as binding and not binding, like this one for example. It's predicted as both active and non-active. Uh, I can click on it and get uh, the same kind of model that I had before. Uh, but this sort of shows the, the, the power of building with all of these the small different models because the models can come from different places. They are located as separate microservices and then I build this on top of it and it, this one calls all these different small microservices. Um, so since I feel that I don't have so much time, um, yeah, I, let's try with this one as well. Uh, it's the same thing here. There's a this is kind of a bit like uh, what we've seen before. This is our system for building and uh, deploying models. So we can upload a data set uh, and we can create a model based on our uh, uh, approach here. So we have um, regression and uh, we only do uh, support vector machines. That's what we're working with. Uh, and this one also, all oh right, this was the thing that didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, since I feel that I don't have much time, I'm, I'm going to stop here and just let someone else continue because better spend time. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I hope that you know, what you see is that we are still working on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, then let me. Go. I will also be very, very brief. Um, but uh, what I would like to, to, to show is that what we ha had so far is on the one side this um, API and Swagger um, kind of way, which is relatively complex uh, and, and 
is probably for for one or two things um, or try something out but it's definitely not something you want to uh, want to do with all your compounds or um, doing that step by step copying URLs um, and then do that the next time when you have the same problem again um, and on the other side we have the um, graphical user interfaces which can provide some functionality uh, but uh, they are not that flexible you know, therefore you when you want to use them you still have to hope that that the person will write a nice interface to that that you can uh, work on that the two remaining uh, um, presentations will show that there are also ways in between you know that you can script that you can create workflows with different tools, which are then can run the uh, can be run automatically, where you can um, use the the tools which are coming with the with the scripting languages. One way, and and this is becoming probably at least for me the main main uh, running the tool for for Open RiskNet are these uh, Jupyter notebooks because this is something where we can also send around um, examples how to to approach something, um, and it is bringing the, the advantage that you can really use the full APIs, uh, but then also do some things uh, by, by the normal progr uh, programming languages. Um, what I use here is Python. Uh, there are R uh, versions as well uh, and something else, uh, but um, in principle, the concept is the same. Um, main points are these things here, yeah? the get requests where we directly um, uh, query things to the different APIs. You, you need the, the string where to access that, and this is a way which we provide one of these very simple uh, use um, um, helper tools where we get from a set of compounds um, to the smile string and, and many other things to, to be able to then do calculations. Yeah, this is uh, based on a service we provide, um, and then as I said, the nice thing is that you can use this Jupyter and Python functionality to present that into nice images. And, and at first try to figure out how this is working. Um, and then you can combine different ways. Yeah, the first thing is, okay, I need my string to do something, but now I can, for example, access with for these compounds, I can access the the um, TG gates data. Again, it's one one uh, um, query to the to the APIs, the TG gates APIs. Um, we have different filters here. We filter on the compounds I selected before, human, liver, and so on, single exposure. Um, and when I just run that here. Um, I will first get, and this is just to show you how you get this um, um, JSON output, which is not really user-friendly, uh, but it's really nice for a computer. And then you go back and just format that a little bit. Also select here um, full changes, which are larger than one. But in principle, that is, um, you can now do a lot of these things online with these uh, first use also your internal scripts if you have something, combine that. Um, this is then the whole thing in a matrix. You can visualize that in heat maps because that is just a normal JSON, uh, normal JSON, normal um, Python. And now we go to other services, for example, here the, the bridge DB, which Tim already mentioned that this is deployed. Um, to get from this um, identifiers uh, in, in uh, TG gates, uh, yeah, to something which we can then also use in in other pro um, programs, for example here. Sorry, um, going to the the ensemble uh, identifiers, which are then linked into um, into um, pathway analysis, which we use at the moment, wiki pathway to do that. Um, this is available, this whole um, workflow is available on, on the web as well, on our website. Um, it is not something dramatically, yeah? it's not meant to, to do 
uh, work um, or have a high sophisticated um, um, a bioinformatics workflow, but it shows a little bit how these different tools can come now together in a harmonized, better way by all doing this uh, via the APIs and different um, API calls. Or here, this is a, so this is a um, um, querying uh, tool here for uh, yeah um, to 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 get the 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 information from. Um, um, uh, wiki pathways to then end up with a list of genes and uh, and and the corresponding uh, pathways. Now, as I said, it's not something which I would use for for doing high sophisticated bioinformatics, but that can come in yeah, because now you you have the idea, hopefully the idea, how you can combine these um, with everything which is available in OpenRiskNet or beyond, which can be accessed like, uh, with an API. Now, this is the idea, and you can now uh, structure workflows um, and then provide these workflows also to people who are less experienced in, in a script uh, as a service. Or you could even build a um, GUI on top of that, which is then executing the services. That was my part. I think the last demo is Tim, and then we can finally wrap up. So we started with a few applications from partners, uh, and those applications very often come with a user interface to use that application. Um, but to solve some of the more extensive case studies, we need to use multiple applications. And the user interface to any one of those is unlikely to be able to solve the problem. So we need to move towards uh, a situation where we've got a more workflow-like environment um, that lets us a uh, link between different applications and using the service-driven um, approach that we described earlier. And Thomas showed quite nicely how you can do that in Jupyter Notebooks. And he was showing how you could use data from one service and, and, and then send it to another service and things like that. Um, and that's all very nice, um, but we, we yeah, part of our target audience is, is scientists, real end user scientists. And you can be pretty sure that they don't want to use, um, they don't want to, have, want to have to program in Python. So whilst Jupyter um, is a really nice tool for someone who, can, you know, who is a programmer, it's not suitable for end user scientists. And so the second workflow tool that we're going to show you now, the Squonk Computational Notebook, um, is a tool that takes a very different approach and is really designed um, at the, yeah, at the um, at, at, you know, specifically at the end user scientist who's not a programmer, they just want a nice simple to use inter user interface that's drag and drop. I don't have time to show you this in detail, but what I'll do is just show you, run you through a couple of notebooks that, that, that I've already created, just to give you a feel for the sort of things you can do and very quickly just show you how you can actually design a notebook. I'll try to be about sort of two, two, two or three minutes, no more. So here's a, here's a simple workflow I put together that reads some structures from an SD file and then does some log P and solubility calculations using some services that in this case are built into Squonk. But as we progress um, with the project, these services will also be, be the ones that are available from the other partner programs or maybe third party programs that are, that, that are in there and discoverable using the, um, the, the, the open risk re registry that, we, that, that I described earlier. So this is a way how you can just do calculations from a number of services, collect the results together and then visualize it and analyze it and, and, and do things like that. A slightly more, um, Detailed example is a data curation um, case study, which fits quite nicely with one of the case studies um, that Thomas described earlier, the data cure one. Here we're fetching some data from uh, Kemble. Um, so we've got you know, a service here that goes to Kemble, extracts out a, a specific assay. In this case, we're extracting four uh, cytochrome P450 inhibition assays, which um, are chosen because there's a great deal of overlap in the compounds between them. We're wanting to curate a data set that has uh, P450 inhibition data. So we've generated those four data sets by extracting them from Kemble. We then merge them together um, based on the Kemble identifier. We then have a process for transforming that data. Whenever you have some data, you nearly always have to clean it up or transform it in some way to convert text to numbers and you know, remove dirty data and things like that. So that's what this does. And then we can, uh, and then um, <clears throat> next step, 
with that cleaned up and unified data set, we then um, do a Lipinski uh, filter on those those compounds to get the drug-like uh, molecules, and then we visualize them in, you know, and we can explore and mine through the data. So again, this data comes from an external source. We can be combining data from multiple sources. We could use services to calculate new properties, which come from any of the partner programs um, or third-party programs and things like that. So here's a nice visual way how you can do that. And very quickly, I'll just show you how you put these together. Um, otherwise, you might think it's all smoke and mirrors. I've already loaded up a data, a data set here that contains uh, 756 uh, DHFR inhibitors. Let's say I want to cluster these molecules. So I find the tool that I want to use, which in this case is Bettina clustering using an RD kit implementation. I might want to specify a, a particular threshold, let's say 0.55 and I then execute it. This, uh, you know, these structures are now being sent to uh, this service for execution. This could in, in future be one of the partner services to, um, to do maybe as a predictive modeling um, that we've seen earlier in some of the other services and things like that. Uh, while that's running, let's now assume we want to do a Lipinski filter on the, um, on the results. You'll see here we've got um, 27 clusters that are identified there. We'll then take the output of that uh, to become the input of the um, Lipinski filter. And this, you can see how we can build together in a, in, in a fairly simple and easy way. Um, you can pipe together things. Um, the input of one, you know, the output of one process becomes the input of the next. And then we can view those results and you'll see that we've got not only the data that was there in the in the original SD file, this is the activity data, but we've got the properties that were predicted by the Lipinski filter, and we've got the cluster number that the cl that the, each compound was assigned to, and we could go on and do further visual or, or, or computational analysis on that. So I'll, I'll leave it there because we are running out of time, um, but this is our solution, um, well, one of our solutions uh, for real end, up, end, end user type access where over time we'll be incorporating many more of the partner applications and making them accessible into this interface. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, as, as Tim already said, we're running out of time. Um, thanks that you stick with us uh, so long. Um, I would like, really sorry about that, but I think we, we have a couple of very, very important slides at the end. Therefore, I would like to, to let you stick um, ten, five minutes with me. Why this is so important is that this is now also asking or giving you the chance, let's put it positive, <laughs> giving you the chance to really decide what this project will look like and, and also being involved. And it is one thing is definitely with the third party providers, which we would like to ask to join. Um, but also the, the early testers. The first thing is the infrastructure is open to everyone. You know, therefore, the ASOCC partner program is something on top of that. Uh, but if you just want to test it first, please go ahead and go into the reference infrastructure with your LinkedIn ID or GitHub ID, and you can directly do it without any uh, formal um, application to, to an associate. But if you see that this is, uh, uh, is something you would like to use more and would like to become more involved in, we have quite some things which we would like to do. The first one is, and it's perhaps also a little bit of an um, advertisement, but we are on different different meetings and please come there and talk to us. Uh, these are the next ones. They are all on the on our website. And definitely one thing is the Open Talks Euro Conference, where we will present more of these tools and and especially also the bio uh, biokinetics tool, which Philip already showcased. Um, the next thing is, I mentioned that at the beginning, we have this survey, and these are really help, help us a lot if you go in there and, and give us information on more general, um, more general questions like what, what 
are our our people who are interested in that you know where you come from but but then also more specific uh, presentations on the semantic interoperability even if you still probably don't know what that exactly means um but the first the most important thing for me at the moment is really this implementation challenge yeah you know, to 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 people in the audience who have tools which they think they would like to bring in and which brings a benefit to us because we cannot cover everything. Open Wisconet Consortium is not that big that we can really build everything and therefore it's important that you that you help us with with your tools and we would like to help you and this is where this implement challenge, um, implementation challenge is coming in. We really have money on the side which can provide which we can provide to you to bring your tools to a level that it can be integrated. Um, and there are these different steps which we have uh, and, and it's clear that we need from the concept I think you know we need APIs. Um, we need to containerize these these all these steps. We, we just boil that down to eight operations, which you probably have to perform to, to bring your system into open risk net. And in principle, the last three are something we will provide for you yeah, independently on, on the challenge. It's something where we would like to bring also your tool, uh, make it more, um, known to to many other people by linking that into different different uh, repositories like biotools or, or the tests from Alexia. and all these therefore whenever you come in and you say okay you have something which is and um, i jump over that because we don't have the time if you think something you have something which really fits into that uh, structure um here are some things which we would like to to put into there first because um, we want to have this widespread application which means when we select and the first deadline is in sorry that was wrong in in a couple of days even if we will definitely extend this deadline um if you think you have something which gives um some of these aspects of the infrastructure yeah, uh, will really probe that, like different demands on computer resources, um, linking different tools, yeah, or for example, need the access of, uh, to commercial um, licenses. We also want to, to, to provide, it's not only free tools, yeah, the infrastructure is free, therefore we are calling open risk, net. but the tools, the services which come in can be commercial. Yeah, therefore, this is also something which we when you think you have, is complementary to what we have, please go ahead and apply for this implementation. Um, the final thing I already said, this is something which we would like to um, many people to be involved, but this might be the second step, especially for these early adopters. You don't have to become partner, but uh, you will have a little bit of, or you will have benefits more support, easier access, and, and also this, this way to, to um, show us where we have to go if you become an uh, associated partner. I think for the service provider, there is definitely the benefit of this impl uh, implementation challenge, uh, but then also for others which who say, okay, in principle, I don't need money. I'm already there, therefore I can just provide that then we, we would have this kind of formal agreement with you as a partner. Um, we have already four, this is just to, to show them, but uh, we definitely want to have more, especially in the service provider area. But I think this is now coming. And, and with every additional partner, we have additional tools. And, and, and this is how this, this infrastructure will be used. Good, that what everything, as I said, I would like to keep this open, um, the, the implementation ch challenge, because that is definitely something which I would like to see people applying. Um, you can contact me first if you have questions to that, if you don't, if you, if you want to see how much or for what this money can be spent, for example, and, and how much that would 
be um, these kind of things. But as I said, the, the implementation challenge is for us very important and therefore we are completely committed to then also support the, uh, the partners in technical development, but also then financial. Thank you everyone for coming and hope to see you soon or talk to you soon whenever we have the chance to do so. Thank you, bye.